You are the man on taxes. And let me ask you, going all the way back to 1985, when I look at the percentage of federal revenues as a percentage of GDP throughout that period of time, it has not gone up, even from the days of Ronald Reagan. Have you succeeded? Should you declare a victory? Well, yes, in the sense that uh, the goal is to have the government take less of people's resources and allow them to have more freedom and more liberty and to have businesses invest based on what's a good investment, uh, not you know, what tax policies are. So uh, I'm happy that we've stopped a lot. We've taken the rates down dramatically. Remember, top rate was 70 percent when Reagan walked in the door. Uh, it got down as low as 28 percent. Unfortunately, Bush let that back up. But uh, there's more to be done at the national level. The reduction of the corporate income tax that the Republicans did in 2017 uh, made us more competitive with China. The danger with the tax increase, one of the tax increases that Biden's looking at, taking the top rate to 28, uh, corporate rate, the corporate, that would put it up higher than China, higher than anyone we compete with in Europe. When we were at 21, we were much more competitive. We are at 21 now. But if we go back up to 28 and you have to add, most states have a state corporate income tax, we become very uncompetitive with China, Japan, Europe. Grover, as you know better than I, it's not just the marginal rate that counts. It's the total tax burden. And if you look at OECD countries, in fact, they have VAT taxes, other taxes they pay. And there's a Peterson Institute study that actually says we're at the bottom of the pack when it comes to OECD countries, the competitors. What do you say about those numbers? Well, we have less spend, less taxation as a percentage of our income, as a percentage of our assets, uh, which is good. That's why we've historically grown faster than Europe. That's why we're the GDP is stronger in the United States per capita than than other places. Uh, the value added tax that they have in Europe is how they got government bigger. There's a certain point at which you can't get any more blood out of the turnip with individual tax rates, both on companies and on individuals. We're probably above that point now. Uh, but the Europeans have decided you can increase the size of the government with a value added tax, which is in some cases 21, 25 percent uh, in Europe. It's a sales tax at all levels of production. And that's one of the ideas that some in America have. Why don't we have a carbon tax, which would then become the VAT tax? Then we'd look like Europe. And I guess my argument is if you want to see innovation, growth, job creation, you don't want to look like Europe. Uh, Grover, is there a right number for the percentage of GDP that should be taxed? I mean, there's something called Hauser's Law that I've read about that says basically, no matter what the marginal rate is in the United States going back to 1945, we come out with somewhere between 17 and 20 percent. Right now, I think we're about 17.9 percent. Is there a right number? I think you, you find that out by bringing it down and seeing if it gets you more growth. You certainly saw when Coolidge cut tax rates, you saw strong economic growth until Hoover raised them. Uh, and then when John F. Kennedy cut marginal tax rates, you had strong growth until Nixon raised taxes. And with Reagan, you had the strong growth until Bush and then Clinton raised taxes. So it's so we've been getting towards a point which may ma maximize revenue. I'm not sure maximizing revenue is the key. I'd like to maximize growth and job creation uh, and innovation. Uh, certainly, we, we learn a lot from the states. There are 50 states. Eight of them have no personal income tax at all, and they tend to be doing better than other states. People move to Texas and Tennessee and Washington State uh, and Florida. Uh, and now there are another and there are another eight states that have single rate taxes. So even Democrat or, or progressive states like Massachusetts and uh, Illinois have lower income tax rates on individuals, 5 percent in Massachusetts, about 4 percent in Illinois, because it's a flat rate tax, and that's difficult for politicians to raise, easier uh, to reduce. But there are now eight states that have income taxes that are phasing those out. You just saw the vote in Georgia to begin phasing out uh, the income tax to zero. Uh, Mississippi's done the same thing. Louisiana did last year. Uh, Iowa, uh, top rate individuals, six and a half down to a 4%, under 4% flat rate, with the goal of then taking it down uh, to zero. Oklahoma is looking to do the same thing, both in uh, North Dakota and in uh, Vir West Virginia. One body has voted to phase it out to zero, and the other is looking to do it. So there's a movement to follow the success of the lower income tax states 
nationally among the 50 states. And we've seen in the United States, when we took our corporate rate with the Reagan tax cuts down to 35, we had one of the lowest corporate rate taxes back in the 80s. Then all the other countries said, that's a great idea. And they all came in under our 35% rate. And so for quite some time, we were very uncompetitive. We're down to 21% now, which makes us fairly competitive, but not ahead of everybody else, just in the middle. Grover, talk about that relationship between taxes on the one hand, the rate of taxation on the one hand, and economic growth on the other. Is it that clear a relationship? Because as I recall, as you mentioned, there's a Clinton tax raise during the Clinton administration, and in fact, growth went up, did it not? Well, you also at that point had a significant cut in the capital gains tax, which the Republicans forced through in 94 as soon as uh, they took control of the House and Senate. Growth under Clinton was weak for the first two years when he was threatening all sorts of tax increases. When the Republicans took the House and Senate, it meant there wouldn't be a tax increase. In fact, there was a, a cut in capital gains taxes. That's when you saw the dramatic growth that flowed through. So watch Congress more than the president when you want to see what people think will happen with taxes, because Republican presidents can get forced by Democratic Congresses to raise taxes. Democratic presidents can get forced by a Republican Congress to cut them. Watch the Congress to see how it goes. But on the competition issue, one of the most dangerous things that's being discussed is this global minimum tax, which would end tax competition. So instead of competing with lower taxes and low costs of government, we're going to compete with what? Lower wages. That's not what America wants to compete on. We want to compete on a more competent government with lower tax rates uh, and more innovation that flows from that, not by trying to beggar their neighbor with lower wages. So this OPEC or cartel of getting all the countries together and saying, we're going to trust China won't cheat, which by having lower tax rates than you're supposed to, one wonders, and so many of their companies are run by the government, be awfully easy to manipulate that compared to the United States or European countries. I think the idea of a cartel where the governments get together and set a minimum tax would stop tax competition, which has been very healthy. And in the same category, the other danger that we're hearing about is price controls on pharmaceuticals. Not a, it's sort of a tax or a confiscation of people's uh, wealth, but it also means less innovation, less investment into pharmaceuticals for the next time there's another COVID. Uh, that's particularly damaging. And there's 2,000 years of history of very bad results every time you fix prices, when the government fixes prices and has wages and or price controls. Yeah, I, I should note that I think that part of the motivation for the global minimum tax was to avoid what you were describing earlier, which is putting U.S. companies at a disadvantage. But I really am curious, Grover, more generally, you've been on this quest for a long time now. You've been very consistent about it. Is what drives you fundamentally economics, that is, the need for more growth, or is almost a matter of philosophy or even morality about really what's fair and what's right about how much the government gets, how much individuals get? I think it's three things. The Constitution's fairly clear about certain limits, particularly on the federal government, on taxation, what's allowed to be taxed. The idea that Biden has of taxing assets or unrealized gain is clearly not constitutional. The courts have ruled on this in the past, but you just have to read the Constitution to see the very limited number of powers that the states were willing to give the central government when they agreed to the Constitution. They made it very clear what you can and can't do. Taxing assets, taxing wealth, taxing unrealized income, meaning income you don't have, the value of your house goes up and they want to tax the income you got because your house is worth $10,000 more, that sort of thing. Bad policy, but it's also not constitutional. So I think step one, is it constitutional? Step two, is it good for the, for the economy? Does it, why would you raise taxes at a point where it kills jobs and slows economic growth? And then third, there's a preference. If you earned a dollar, it's yours. And the government needs to have a very good reason to explain why it has to take your dollar and spend it some other way. Um, so I think that we ought to say, you earned it, it's yours. Now the government has to make the case why it's actually necessary and important and not counterproductive to take some or all of that.